<laughs> Isn't technology great? Well, only when it works. For a first time home recording, this is what you're going to get. If this streamed viewing incurs any major trouble, we will just shift to the announcements. And you can now view this study online on our video archive site, vimeo.com slash okill. So thankful for everyone's prayers, uh, our shared trials, only strengthen our spiritual bond. Others, others are truly in more urgent need of the Lord's hand of healing and comfort. I say that and I think of the word comfort. I'm mindful of our unique study tonight. We are picking right back up where we took a pause in our midweek series on spiritual gifts. Let's now review and conclude the latter half of session five, part two. And we're spotlighting various spiritual gifts, of course, and spiritual gifts which uh, some obviously excel in, perhaps best understood as a God-given ability or skill that enables the recipient, the child of God, to perform a function in the body of Christ with ease, even enjoyment, and success. We are all born with natural talents, but upon spiritual rebirth, God's redeemed being, uh, begin maturing in a divinely given, providentially honed set of skills that make them particularly suitable to carry out functions that serve the body in very particular ways. Uh, the sign gifts have fulfilled their purpose, but we are blessed by God to meet daily needs, and we give Him the glory for all we are and can do and become. The word exhort means a calling to one's side to aid, and the exhorter is just that. The exhorter comes along to the side of people and builds them up to help them out. Thank God for those people. Uh, as a pre-study reminder, we all have responsibilities in each of these areas. They are commands that we are to grow in. But we each have higher God-given giftedness in at least one of these areas. How did you do earlier marking yourself on these five character strengths of an exhorter? Number one, exhorters have a strong drive to help people. They're driven to this. Uh, they are... Mm. They're thrilled to empower others to succeed. Think about how, again, Barnabas was used to empower Saul, to move him by perception from being a, a feared persecutor to a respected brother and a teacher. And as Ron highlighted earlier, to keep unity between him, Mark, and countless brethren. Point three, exhorters often accept others as they are. Uh, early Paul was focused on Mark's failure, but Barnabas saw his present worth and his potential. Exhorters focus more on not just knowing the Word, but helping others live it out. We, recently, uh, we were recently reminded that the people gave Joseph, this man Joseph, this honorable nickname, son of or nature of encouragement, because he was such a good encouragement to them, a good man. Exhorters are greatly loved because of their help, their attitude, and their positive outlook on life. We will soon mention some tips to help us grow in exhortation, but for those of us who maybe have highly ranked ourselves in these categories, you just may relate all too well with these. Some common struggles and stumbles of a maturing exhorter. Again, ranking high in section one of each of these classes presents the goal or the challenge to steadily decrease your ranking in section two. That shows maturity and growth, the weaknesses that we have to overcome. Whenever we pick on youthful Peter, please don't forget the person that Christ developed him to be. We all want to be with the Peter of those first and second epistles. But had we been around the Peter of Jesus' ministry days, uh, he probably would have uh, irritated the mess out of 98% of us. 
but we all have youthful Peters in our lives. Uh, I actually understand youthful Peter more if I view him through the prism of, of a maturing exhorter. Exhorters can be, number one, outspokenly opinionated. Matthew 16, 22. They're blessed with a natural inclination to talk. So, if it comes into the mind, it tends to fly out the mouth. <laughs> but not in a bad way, sort of. They, they mean well. The exhorter naturally means only good. They're quick to think and express their good intentions. And the world needs more people who are self-driven, optimistic, and motivational. But can you imagine being so sure of yourself? that you would not hesitate pulling Jesus aside to rebuke him? <sighs> yes, that's exactly what Peter did. A good heart, but immature spirit. Exhorters tend to draw conclusions quickly and without discussion, act impulsively and leap before looking, which ironically can hurt the very relationships they intend to build. They are so forward because they are so sure they have the helpful answers already. And they just might. Their driven nature has produced a lot of experience. And that experience has taught them and it has fueled their confidence. But maturing exhorters have strenuously learned through the past when not to answer questions that haven't been asked, when to offer uh, when not to offer unsolicited advice or assistance. And learning this can be tough. Maybe tougher on those interacting with the maturing exhorter. Because, while others are just inconsiderate, the exhorter's quick thinking nature to speak helpful advice makes them prone as well to interrupt rather than listening. Like for Peter, it's not easy to, well, it recondition behavior, <laughs> your natural self, to just slow down, pause, observe, ponder a little bit longer, and just see if there's something that the Lord wants you to learn. Remember the episode of Jesus washing the disciples' feet in John chapter 13, verses 5 through 10? Jesus did this to pass on one of the greatest lessons they would ever need to know about servanthood, but Peter would not wait for Jesus' words that might follow. He just couldn't. When he saw Jesus, who is Master, doing a servant's job, his mind was racing, maybe knowing that Jesus was likely aware of their inner squabble earlier about who would be the greatest in the kingdom, and maybe seeing this as a test. Who would first humbly acknowledge that Jesus is the best? I know. I will. I'll say it. So, quick thinking, quick talking Peter did not wait for the lesson. He, I guess you could say in the process, interrupted Jesus' deed with his view. Have you ever imagined how this conversation could have played out in real time? It would be something like, Peter says, You Washing my feet? You're the master. Clearly this isn't right. And then Jesus says, it's okay. I know this doesn't make sense right now. And it even seems wrong perhaps to you. But just let me do this and you will understand later. But Jesus, Peter jumps in and says, no, no, no. But Lord, 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 you shall never wash my feet. <sighs> Jesus, thinking of his well-intentioned heart, but immature, impatient spirit, <laughs> What can Jesus say to get him to be quiet <laughs> and, and to be at peace in what he does not yet understand? That's a very uncomfortable spot. And just let things happen. Jesus says, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Well, that did it. Peter, with his mind racing 4,000 RPMs, quickly adjusted his view and expressed a, a different perspective, true to his nature. Then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Okay. See, Jesus' next comment in the text helped to settle Peter's mind to know that Jesus knows his heart. But I risk saying that exhorters, maturing exhorters, are so eager to helpfully speak their mind 
that 97% of the time they don't even know they're interrupting. They don't even know it. They might miss important points because <laughs> they mistake your spoken commas for periods. Because you're not done yet. Exhorters are blessed with a quick mind and a tongue to speak it, and early on it can be tortuous to wait on others to finish what they're saying. But that's important. They do uh, swing fast and often hit home runs. But being too quick to verbalize conclusions or solutions can be bad. Proverbs 18, 13, they need to take to heart. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. I would suggest even if the answer is correct, patience. The exhorters also tend to uh, people-pleasing. Galatians chapter 2. How does this happen? The exhorters justly care about how others see them and how they are perceived. They want to be liked because they believe they can best help those who like them. So they want others to like them. Okay, this is a strength. This can also be a weakness. This can be a tragic sin. Because remember the staunch teacher who might be a, a little too accustomed to not caring how people view them because they are able to just boldly assert hard truths? On the other extreme, you have the youthful exhorters that are put in a real strain to boldly uphold truth when it seems that a truth is threatening a relationship. This partly explains Peter's failure in Galatians chapter 2, and from our previous session certainly explains how someone like Paul could quickly correct them, like Peter and Barnabas even, sad to say. Knowing how Peter felt upon denying the Lord, Jesus had divine insight when he instructed them to make sure you go tell the disciples and Peter that I have risen. After denying the Lord, Peter needed to know Jesus was still accepting of him. The exhorter's righteous strength is that they care, and they have a strong need to know they are loved by those they love. But the exhorters can be impulsive. The quick conclusions, the gift of gab, and not thinking things through are all seen in Matthew chapter 14. It's a great account, verses 28 through 33. I heard it said that if Peter had thought this through, stepping out onto the water, if he had thought it through, the continuing winds and waves would have not later presented a problem. Hmm, very interesting, isn't it? So being impulsive, though, is not all bad. Peter was the first of the disciples to declare Jesus as the Christ. But without caution, that impulsiveness can be... Uh, catastrophic. Point five. Exhorters sometimes promise too much, too much more than they can deliver. Matthew 26. Peter said, I'll never deny you because he could not in that moment imagine anything happening to turn him away from Jesus. He was ready to die for Jesus, and I believe he absolutely meant that. After all, he was the one who attacked the servant in the, of the high priest in the garden. But Peter was wrong. He would fall away, just like Jesus said. Exhorters fully intend to do what they say. But they fight to keep that willingness to help tempered with the reality of a 16-hour day if you sleep. Their desire to please can produce overcommitment. And if these struggles sound all too familiar to you, you might be an exhorter. And that's great. Just keep growing because we need people to exhort us. And we need to do that for others. Um, much of the opportunity uh, in the local congregation does exist. But it might be right under your nose, like classes, sermons, articles, prayers, recruiting and training Christians to fill other roles. You can do this. You're an exhorter. Personal Bible studies, one-on-one, -on -one, visitation, hospitals, home, nursing homes, and letters, cards, emails, phone calls, yes, counseling, life coaching. The exhorter has so much opportunity before him or her. If we are ranking ourselves uh, in this uh, category very low, uh, then suggestions will help increase this as a command. These are commands, remember. We are supposed to exhort. 
Step one, become friends with an exhorter. Just observe all that they say, all that they do, all they don't do, and all they don't say. Talk with them afterwards so that you can take notes and learn. Uh, customize it for yourself. Also, spend time with people. We have to change how much private time we prioritize because to exhort people requires getting out among people. Exhorting takes time because you have to listen to people's hopes and dreams and let the passing of time itself show that you support them. Also, point three, learn mercy. We're going to talk about that in a couple classes from now, but instead of just labeling people as either getting it or not getting it, there or not there, be more like an exhorter who sees people on a spectrum of growth. They are getting there. They're getting there. We, and we, aren't we all still growing? Indeed we are. Let's learn to practice that love and mercy that we would like to be shown. Place a number 10 on everyone's head, not literally, but in your mind. Place a 10 on their head and resist the temptation to decrease it the more you get to know them. <laughs> Keep that value, number 10. Exhorters are so encouraging and beloved because they see the constant value of people. And then think application. Application, application. To most effectively exhort and inspire another. Look at it this way. Try picking up where the teacher leaves off. Think of ways to motivate and think of ways to help others to spe uh, specifically live out the Word of God. Here's a question for you. Where would we be without all of the encouragement that we have received? Oh, I don't want to think about that too long. Thank God for those people who've been given the gift to exhort us. And thank those people who are using it. And thank you, by the way, so much for participating in this unique study, listening to the words. Our maturing never stops. So keep studying the Word and reflecting Christ's Spirit. And now it's time for our live stream announcements.